Hello and welcome to Cinema DMA. Today we're here with Dr. Martha Rogers, who is a founding partner of Peppers and Rogers, um, a company that has been around for quite a while. She's been named one of the 19 most important business gurus of the past century. So listen up everybody, we're going to hear from one of the best in marketing. And uh, Martha, just please, if you could tell us a little bit about Peppers and Rogers, and if there's something really important that I left out about you, you know, go ahead and tell us. <laughs> well, Sue, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank it's you so much. Pleasure to have you here. We're really lucky. So thank you. <laughs> well, you know, we, we um, Peppers and Rogers Group has been around now for 17 years, so we've uh, we've been working hard. We've got now about 200 people worldwide, and uh, the company. Uh, we, what we try to do is help other companies, help our clients figure out how to make the most of the most important asset they have, which is their customers. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is help them uh, figure out how to, to uh, we use analytics and other strategies to help them uh, build the value of their customer base. So it's a customer management consulting firm. That's great. You know, we've been hearing a lot about customers recently, um, you know, but you really give it a, a lot of backbone and a lot of meat behind <laughs> it and give people a reason and, and really legitimate stats on how to talk about the customer and how to go after them. But um, we'll, so we'll start with a really small question. <laughs> what, what are the biggest challenges that um, <laughs> marketers are facing today? I mean, there are so many, but really, what are the, life is changing at a, a really rapid pace. What, what are you hearing these days? Well, you know, the easy thing to do would be to say it's the whole social networking thing, and it's mm -hmm. the customer empowerment thing, and it's the employee empowerment thing, and it's, it's uh, even all of the, what we call humans.net. Uh, but it's also, uh, but I think that there's really a bigger issue, which is that we've been operating in this new environment on old assumptions that just don't really work anymore. And, and yet, they, because they're so deeply ingrained in us, they still inform all the decisions that we make. So, so assumptions like, uh, oh, if only the marketing and sales will do their job right, then we can always get more customers. But the fact is that there are a finite number of customers. And even if there are a whole bunch of people in the world, there are only so many people who will ever want to be able to afford or, or can adapt to or are interested in our product. And so to the extent that, that we can get the business from those customers and get more of their business than our competitors can and get their business from now on, then that's how much business we can have. So that's an important one. Another, uh, another one is that uh, the assumption that it's our great products and our services and and our brands and all those things are important, but but the assumption that that's what what really creates all the value for our business is just wrong because there's not a product on this planet that pays us money, and there's not a brand that pays us money, and there's not any other thing that's important for us to develop. Only customers pay us money, and the only money we're ever going to make is from the customers that we have right now and the customers we're going to have tomorrow, and that's why we have to have great products and brands and people and everything else but it's the customers who either do or don't create all the value for us. Well, you're right. And thank you for reminding everybody <laughs> what to focus on and where what's what yeah. a reality check, right? yeah. really a re reality check. Now, you have a, a new book I also do. here. It's Rules to Break and Laws to Follow. Um, I usually just break rules, so um, <laughs> we'll have to get the, the, the Peppers and Rogers police after us. <laughs> one, one of the things that you were um, really talking about a lot in this book that I understand is about trust. So could you tell us... How, how does trust find its way into business, especially in what we've been hearing the past yeah. few years? It's, an, it's a very interesting assumption that you're making there. Well, you know, the fact is, is that we read a lot of headlines about the companies that have violated trust. But what we don't read in the headlines are about the many companies that are just moving along, doing a fine job, doing exactly what their customers need, we're looking out for their customers, taking the customer's point of view, looking out for the customer's interests, and doing so very competently. And those are the companies that don't make headlines and that we don't hear about. And yet those are the ones where it would be better um, to work. It would be better to be the customer of those companies. It would be better to be a shareholder of those companies. So while we're reading all these terrible headlines, all they're doing, those headlines, is, is really proving to us the sort of the opposite of the point, which is that if you don't build trust, that you're going to get yourself into trouble. So you may end up in jail. We've seen that happen a few times. Yes, we have. But even if you don't, if you don't do that, if what you do is only tacky and not exactly illegal, 
then you're still you're still not going to survive in the long run. You're not going to, to do well. So um, so what we we have developed is this return on customer measure that helps companies really codify and measure and then manage this insistence on on really building the value in the short term and balancing that with the long term because the companies that do that were the ones that got through the recession okay. They're the ones that are coming out better. They're the ones whose customers stay by them in, through thick and thin. And so those are the companies that we think are really poised to be the winners uh, when we start looking at the Fortune 500s and the global 6,000s of the future. Okay, so you, you give a lot of great advice to businesses and um, you talk about what they really need to focus on. One of the things that's coming out a lot is the idea of convergence. So short term, long term, you talk about that a lot, where yeah. to focus, how to balance that. So convergence is a balancing act in and of itself. So what do you advise businesses in regard to that as well? When we think about convergence, you know, there are a lot of ways to look at it, right? But I think the most important thing is that we're going to be driven by what it is that customers do. And it's really not surprising when we first started looking at, think about this, Ten years ago, we started realizing through early measurements and research that customers that used more than one channel to reach a company, so a retail customer who went to the store and did things on the web and did things over the phone and did things through the catalog, that those were much more valuable customers than anybody who, say, only went to the store who or who only ordered from the catalog. And so we saw that early kind of convergence then. Now look what's happened to channels. Look what's happened to the way that we fund things. Look what's happened to the way we think about the globalization of companies and the way we're going to uh, fit ourselves into communities and into uh, supporting those communities, supporting the environment. You know, that convergence is really a lot of it. And I will say, if I can just yeah, of course, book, of course, book up, course. that one of the things that, reasons that we wrote this book, notice how I'll just, I'll just put it like this. Of course. <laughs> but the, one of the things that we thought was that here's trust is a very important topic. Here's social networking, a very important topic. Employee empowerment, very important topics. Uh, and there are a lot of really good books written on trust. There are good books written on each of these topics. But what we wanted to know was how innovation and customer empowerment and employee networking and, and all the rest of it comes together and helps to inform us as we're making every decision every day. And that's what we tried to do in this book, was to try to bring all the findings and the thinking, um, adding some of our own on those important topics. And after we'd been working and working and working for six months, we had to call the publisher and say, we need another six months, because guess what's, what? Why has anybody written this book? Because it was really hard, that's why. Yeah. Um, so it's, but we think that that's really the, the uh, important issue, is how in the world do we um, bring together all of these things when we're thinking about how to build shareholder value and in the process to do what's best for customers which is what's best for us. Well, yeah, and it is, as you say, over and over again, and it's not, it's, it's worth repeating, it's about the customer. Right. Um, so with the customer in mind and with all these channels open, and I see you've been stalking me, but um, <laughs> so brands are not the almighty that they used to be. They're, they're not there to tell you everything. It, it's more about the consumer, the end user saying, uh, all contraire, <laughs> you know, Mr. or Ms. brand person, this is what I really think, this is what I want. More importantly, this is what I need. Right. So how are they dealing with this? How are the brands maintaining any sense of uh, control over their brand, um, or how, how are they managing this? And you know, it's, I, I think your question is an excellent one, because what we've got here is sort of a dichotomy, because the best brands are getting stronger and stronger and stronger, and other brands are sort of becoming mushier and mushier, because... It, Exactly because in both cases of the, um, the, the really almost wild but certainly um, chaotic but still profound impact that customers all talking to each other has. And so what you have are these, I mean, you look at the iconic uh, kinds of brands, Apple is stronger than ever, but it's partly because they have been able to keep control over the, the, the product quality. Steve Jobs is very careful about which applications, mm -hmm. he, which apps mm -hmm. he's going to allow on the iPhone and the iPad and all those kinds of things. Uh, but at the same time, uh, he's also built a lot of trust among his user group and, uh, and also his vendor group. 
So it's, uh, it's very interesting to watch that kind of thing happen. I think what we're really seeing is sort of a redefinition of what we think of as a brand. In the old days, a brand was this, this icon that would stand for something, and it was untouchable. It, it didn't, the, the company would decide what it was, and all the feedback in the world from customers didn't change that. And I think now, many people are starting to think of the brand as, as the brand that is created jointly by uh, the company and the customers and all the customers working together and what's happening to you know, the experience that customers have with whatever it is. And, and, uh, and that's a, 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 a trickier kind of definition of brand because, as you point out, that's not something that people have, that companies have complete control over. So it, it really is a matter of learning how to let go while creating an environment in which your experiences that you create for customers is so powerful and so positive that even if you have a bad day, it's your customers that will come to your defense. It's your customers that will really pull you out and save you and will create that brand and make it strong.